Well, good morning, CIPC, and everyone who's come to join us for service today. Thank you so much for joining us, being with us for church today. We're still having to do church online, but I'm so glad you joined with us and going to be in church with us today as we share the Word of God. We're going to be in the book of Ruth again. Uh, but at any rate, just, just great to, to have you and great to be able to come together this way. And we don't know how much longer, but however long it is, I hope you'll keep joining us and uh, we'll keep uh, shooting these videos out so that we can have church together until we can have church together. Amen? Well, last week I got an email from Happy. I don't know if many of you remember Happy from India. And so he's gone back to India and he's doing great ministry there and he sent me several ministry videos. And so hello, Happy. And we're so happy of the work that you're doing for the Lord in India. Uh, but he sent me a note and he said, Pastor, I'm concerned. I saw the preaching today and you didn't look very well. Are you sick? Are you okay, Pastor? <laughs> and so I wrote him back. I said, yeah, I'm doing just fine. So last week we just had a kind of a busy week and uh, we had to, you know, get the video in there. And so I hadn't shaved and uh, I was just wearing a shirt I'd been wearing all day. So it might have been a little frumpy and of course I haven't had a haircut, I don't think, in all of 2020. So uh, looking a little raggedy, <laughs> but just want to let Happy know, and everybody know, we're in good health, Carol and I both. Carol had the bicycle accident, of course, but her cast is off. She still has some pain in her wrist, really both of her hands, so pray for her, and she still has some uh, concern in her face, so be praying for Sister Carol. But otherwise, she's revived and she exercises almost every day. Uh, especially during this COVID-19, I've been exercising even more. So uh, I run probably two, three days a week and bike uh, about five days a week. So we get out and get some exercise and get outside, get some fresh air. So uh, we're in good health. We're feeling good. We're both feeling strong. So I, again, thanks for being concerned, happy, and sorry to concern you by, by looking bummy last week. <laughs> but at uh, any rate, so today I shaved, I combed my hair, <laughs> I got a fresh shirt on. So I hope I'm looking good today. All right. Well, let's get into it. A few announcements. Uh, we are now in phase two of deconfinement. At least most of us, I think there's still a few cities that are uh, have a little bit stronger confinement. I think both uh, Marrakesh and Tanger. So uh, any of you from our churches there uh, might be watching. Sorry that uh, you guys still have some, some stronger restrictions, but uh, we're entering into Phase two of deconfinement, so some good things there. Uh, the beach is open, restaurants are supposed to open at 50% capacity and some other things, but still no word on church. So I'm really sorry, church, but we're gonna have to follow the guidelines of the government and just wait. And so they haven't said anything. Um, yeah, so we're just waiting and that goes along with mosques and there's a few other things that are still closed if you read the news. Um, so we just wait and we pray and we continue to join together like this, knowing that we serve the Lord, amen? And the church isn't necessarily the building, but the church is us coming together. So uh, I hope that very soon we can come together and share church together. As we do, as I've mentioned before, there may be some restrictions. We, we may be restricted to the number of people that can gather in our building. We, of course, are going to have to wear the mask and uh, do our hand sanitizer going in, going out. And uh, we've already prepared for all of that. We even have the little uh, monitor for, you know, uh, clicking uh, for the temperature. So we're ready to go when they tell us we are allowed. So be in prayer for that. So church will continue to be online until further notice. And when we know, we will update you with Facebook and email. Uh, and of course on our Sunday morning service here. Uh, Kids Church, don't forget to go check out Carol's Kids Church. She does a great job. She loves your kids and she's doing a great job to teach them. In fact, that's what this is from. They're talking about Abraham, Abram and Abraham and Sarai and Sarah. And so uh, at any rate, uh, great lessons from Sister Carol. So make sure you check that out. Get your kiddos around and Carol always has some crafts and things for the kids too. Well, Personally, for Carol and I, I just want to update you, we are planning to go to the United States on July 15th. So we will be with you after today, two more Sundays. Uh, if church opens up and we can meet in the church building, then we will have uh, someone there to preach. We may still do something by video, we'll see. 
Uh, but we'll have somebody in the church, don't worry. We're still hoping the Gooches can come. So that's another prayer point. Please be praying uh, for Pastor John and Penny Gooch. So they live in South Africa. Uh, they were initially told they wouldn't be allowed to travel, but then this week, South Africa said they were gonna allow for business travel. So I asked them to inquire, uh, could they get permission under business because they're coming to do church business. They're coming to fill in for us and their, their pastors. So we hope that will happen and they will be with you for several weeks. But if not, uh, I think most of you know we have three churches. So we still have some staff at those other two churches and we'll be pulling upon them and asking them to send, send pastors to fill in. Uh, whether that be someone comes and stays for several weeks or we have to do some kind of rotation, but we'll work it out. Uh, so be in, be in prayer for that. Uh, we also have our board and some other people in the church that, that can help us. So uh, don't worry, we will, we will make something happen when the time comes. It's still one of those things we just don't know. So we wait, it's hard to make plans. So the biggest plan we're working on would be number one, the Gucci's. And if that doesn't happen, then we'll go to plan B and C and D and on. Uh, worship today. So I've been highlighting for you different worship groups and a few different songs. So this week I wanted to highlight for you Jesus Culture. I don't know if you've ever listened to them. Uh, they've been around for a little while now and really good stuff. Uh, and so at any rate, I, I'm going to put the link for the Jesus Culture channel below on YouTube. So check that out and do some worship with Jesus Culture today. And then just wanted to highlight for you a couple songs. Freedom is coming. What a great song during this COVID-19 season. Amen. Freedom is coming. So uh, hallelujah. We're looking forward to that. And then another song, Freedom. And they sing, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So you be worshiping right in your home so that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. And you be free. And in that song, it says, so dance like the weight has been lifted. Do you have a weight upon your life right now? Check out that song. I'll put the link below. But listen to those words, dance like the weight has been lifted. A lot of you have got a lot of weight on you. You're worried about, man, is school going to start for my kids when summer's over? Am I, is my job going to come back? Is my business going to come back? And a lot of, lot of concerns, a lot of burdens, maybe a lot of bills. Maybe income hasn't come, but, but bills are stacking up. And, and we know we've had a lot of relief during COVID-19, but... Uh, most of those bills have to be caught up. They're not just completely forgiven. And so uh, that may be weighing on you. Well, listen, get into the spirit of the Lord. Amen. Because uh, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so dance like the weight has been lifted because he's going to make a way even where there seems to be no way. So trust in the Lord today uh, that deconfinement's going to go well. Well, giving again, thank you so much. Those of you who have given, you've really helped sustain us and move us forward. And we really appreciate that. As we went into this COVID-19, uh, we certainly managed the church funds well. Uh, when I say we, I mean uh, the board and I. And so we always have uh, sufficient funds uh, to carry us through, not just the month we're in, but, but for several months. And so we felt pretty strong going in. And of course we did all the food distributions and things, but uh, as this thing has lingered on and now going further, there's still a lot of things we're doing. We're still, you know, uh, participating in, in rent of our building. Of course, we did all the food distributions. And so those of you who've given, you've really, really helped. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, for others of you, you may not have any income. Well, don't feel bad about it. And when you do, you tithe, you give, support the church. And uh, we really appreciate uh, supporting the international churches of Morocco, and we appreciate your support of those international churches. So uh, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about mammon, and we saw Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon. And a lot of people take mammon to mean money or wealth. In fact, some Bible translations remove the word mammon and put in money or wealth. Uh, but we talked about that and said that's not really the root of that word and what it means. The root of that word is the name of the Syrian god of riches. And so it was an idol. It was a very specific god. And so now, even though we may not worship that god called Mammon, uh, there is something that a lot of people do, and that is kind of worshiping the world system. And they worship the world system by participating uh, by it and being confined by it. So we as Christians need to learn to break ourselves from that and follow God's system of finances. Amen? 
So like the world system of finance would just say, if you give money, you have less. But God's system says, if you give, you'll have more. Amen. <laughs> so we want to follow God's principles and learn to be blessed under, under his word and not under the world system, not under mammon. And so uh, last week we began talking a little bit about debt because debt, it comes under, the way it operates today comes under the world system. Because of that, a lot of people and preachers have swung the other way and say all debt is wrong. But as we look into the Bible, we see that's not necessarily true, that debt was one of God's principles but then it's been distorted by the world. So that the world basically tells you buy everything on credit. So that people take vacations on credit, they buy their dinner on credit, they might buy their groceries on credit. And so they spend uh, many, many, uh, on many, many things that they don't have the money for. You see, credit is being presumptuous. It's saying, I'm gonna buy something today and I'm gonna pay for it tomorrow and I'm being presumptuous, I'm presuming that I will have the money uh, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year to pay for the money I'm spending today. Well, the problem with that system is not that we do that to sustain ourselves or to advance ourselves, but when we do that and we just start doing that to consume, that everything we want, we want it today and I don't have to wait because there's credit. <laughs> well, uh, sometimes we need to wait in life, amen? They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. So let's look today, let's jump over to uh, Deuteronomy 15. If you got your Bibles, you can open there. And uh, Deuteronomy 15. And he talks here a little bit about credit. And so let's look at that, Deuteronomy 15. Let's start at verse five. <clears throat> And he says, only listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I, command, which I am commanding you today. So he says here, listen obediently, listen attentively, listen with the heart of I'm going to do what the Lord says. All right. He says, for the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised you. Do you know the Lord wants to bless you? Amen. We've talked about that before, uh, that I believe in the prosperity message, but not the extreme thing that some of the prosperity, they call it prosperity gospel people preach, um, but that the Lord wants to bless you, that God's a good God and he has good gifts in store for your life. And so look at this verse, for the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised promised you. He'll do it. He promised it and he'll fulfill his promise. And you, this is, this is the blessing, and you will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. And you will rule over many nations, but they will not rule over you. Hallelujah. So you'll lend and not borrow. You will rule and not be ruled. Somebody out there say hallelujah. Then verse seven, tells us, if there is a poor man with you, one of your brothers in any of your towns in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor close your hand from your poor brother. So he says, you see your brother, he's poor. You don't, don't close yourself up. You're blessed. You're blessed to lend, not to borrow. He says, but you shall freely open your hand to him, and you shall generously lend him sufficient for all his need in whatever he lacks. Now notice there, it doesn't say you will give to him, you will lend to him. Now why did God want there to be a, a system of debt? And we talked about in the book of Ruth why he allowed gleaning to go on instead of just giving to the poor. Because he doesn't want poor people to become under that dependence. He wants them to have dignity. And so he's saying, if you see a poor brother and you can help them by lending to them, you lend them. So you're not buying them, you know, whatever, just what they need today, but you're helping them to start a business or get a job or, or you know, move on in life so that they can work and they can pay you back. Now, it's not wrong to give. We've just given food to many, many people to, to help them, and that's not a loan. We don't want any of the food back or money back. Um, that's a gift, and it is good to give. Uh, but the principle that he's talking about here is being blessed so that you lend and not borrow. Now, we said this last week, that if uh, borrowing 
is intrinsically evil. In other words, by the root of it, if borrowing and debt is evil, then lending would also be evil. But God says it's, you're going to be blessed to lend. So we know that borrowing can't be evil and lending is not evil. It's the way then that it's manipulated under the world system that creates the bondage and creates the evil and creates the scripture we read last week, which said the borrower becomes servant to the lender. And so we don't want to become that. We want to, He just says right here, you're going to rule and people aren't going to rule over you. And so we don't want to become under that bondage. Well, so... Uh, at any rate, the blessing of the Lord, what I want you to see in this, the blessing of the Lord is not to borrow. That borrowing is not evil, but it's not the blessing of the Lord. One time, someone took me out and showed me a brand new car they had bought, a very expensive car, very nice car. Oh, Pastor Chris, look at this new car, and the Lord's blessed me, and they went on with this, like, blessing and from the Lord and all this kind of Christian language. And so I'm thinking, wow, somebody gave them this very expensive car. This is awesome. I got to hear the story. Well, as the person keeps talking, they begin telling me how they took out a loan for this car and how much this car cost. And I just thought, ah, this person does not even understand the blessing of the Lord. It's not a blessing to have debt. <laughs> now, again, it's not evil. And so if you have debt, and you need a debt to go to school, to start a business, maybe to buy a car. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but get out of debt. It's not the blessing of the Lord. Don't stay there. Formulate a plan to pay back what you owe and to free yourself so that you can live free of that. All right. So uh, let's move on into the word today. Before we do just prayer, please be in prayer for our city. Uh, for work to return, for our people of CIPC to return to work, for COVID-19 to die, and for Pastor Chris and Sister Carol to be able to fly on July 15th. All right, let's get in the Word. If you got a phone, turn it off, unless you're watching me on your phone, or silence it, remove it, remove any distractions, get your Bible out. If you need a cup of coffee, get a cup of coffee. And let's get into the word. We are in the book of Ruth. I hope you have loved the book of Ruth. I have really enjoyed our time together in Ruth. And it is just a wonderful book. So let's open up chapter 4, first part of verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Wow. <laughs> well, I already let the cat out of the bag, right? You already know how the story goes. So today we are going to see the culmination of our story that we started back five weeks ago with Empty Handed, and we close today. The title of my message is Redeemed, and we close today with seeing the blessing of the Lord. Uh, so it can be for you. Maybe you feel empty handed, uh, but you're going to see today how you can travel from being empty handed all the way to being blessed. And so if you're feeling that way today, oh, Pastor Chris, I'm empty handed. Don't focus on that. Focus on what can be. Focus on what happens in the life of Ruth and Naomi. Amen. Well, let's pray as we get started. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that today we see Ruth getting married to Boaz. Hallelujah. And then what that means for generations and generations and what that means for us today. What a blessing it is that they got married. And, and Lord, so show us that today as we look into your word. And I pray you would bless everyone who's watching who feels like Naomi did at the beginning of the story when she felt empty handed and she felt broken and beat up. But God, you brought her forth into blessing. And so each one that's watching that may feel beat up and broken, may you bring them forth to blessing in the weeks ahead. Bless the preaching of your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, title of our message today is Redeemed. Redeemed. And we're going to be talking about that. We talked about a little bit last week, the kinsman redeemer and how Ruth is redeemed. All right. If you have not watched the Bible Project Overview of Ruth, I put the link for you last week. We'll put it again this week. Bible Overview of Ruth, uh, Bible Project Overview of Ruth. Uh, check that out. I think it's about seven minutes and it's a little animated thing that will take you through the whole book of Ruth in seven minutes, give you a good uh, overview. It doesn't cover all the details we've covered in all of our sermons. So if you've missed any of those, go back to our YouTube channel 
and you'll find all five sermons there. So, I don't want to take time to go through all those four, but let's go through them real quickly, okay? So we won't go in detail, but real quick. Our first message was empty-handed, and we saw a number of characters immediately as we opened the book of Ruth, and the most prominent was Naomi, whose name means pleasant. And we saw that all these people and places, their names were very significant. But though her name is pleasant, she suffers a lot. She's broken emotionally, spiritually, financially, physically. She's a broken woman. And she is, when the story opens, married to a man named Elimelech. And his name means, that's right, God is my king. And so Pleasant is married to God is my king. They have two children. Their children's name are Malon and Chilion. And that means unhealthy and puny. So we have Pleasant's married to God is my king. And they have two children, unhealthy and puny. Those two children marry, well, Elimelech dies, you know that, and then those two boys get married. They marry Moabite women, and that is Orpah and Ruth, dear and beauty. And then we saw that they came from Bethlehem, which is the house of bread, and Bethlehem's of Judah, and so Judah means praise, so they came from the house of bread and of praise, and they went to Moab, and Moab is toilet. So as the story goes, God is my king, takes pleasant and unhealthy and puny, and, he, and there's no bread. There's a famine in the land in Bethlehem. The house of bread has no bread. So he takes them to Moab, the toilet, because there's bread in the toilet. And when he gets there, he realizes it's a mistake. They shouldn't be there, but they stay anyway. And then he dies in the toilet. And then the two children die in the toilet. And then it is left alone that Naomi is there with her two daughters, and broken. And Naomi decides, I'm going to go home to the house of bread and of praise, but I'm going home empty handed. And we said, as we looked at the story and as we've gone through each sermon now, we've seen Naomi wasn't empty handed. She just felt empty handed. And so I would say that to you also today. If some of you out there, you're going through a hard time and you feel empty handed, recognize right now you just feel empty handed that you really have a lot going for you. And so focus on those things that you have, not on what you don't have. Well, it took us into our second message then, which was fully devoted, because as Naomi goes to go home, these two girls, Orpah and Ruth, uh, dear and beauty, they go along with uh, Naomi on her trek home to Bethlehem. But somewhere along the journey, Naomi says, oh, you girls have gone far enough. I can make rest of it on my own. You guys go home to Moab find new husbands, settle down, have a family, have a life. Orpah says, okay, that's, that's good advice. Ruth says, no, I'm staying with you. And our title of our message was fully devoted because Ruth became fully devoted to the Lord and to Naomi. And this is what she said to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge or sleep, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die, and I'll be buried there next to you. God's a deep commitment, amen? We should learn to have deep, deep commitments in our life, first to the Lord, to our spouse, to our children, but then also to our church, to our friends, um, to our job. Uh, especially if we're the boss, we're, we're running the company, we should have that commitment to our employees, uh, to the business people that we do, to our clients. So we just closed with the importance of this slight decision that Ruth made in her life, changed her destiny forever, and even changed our destiny as we will see today. So are you fully devoted? I, I hope you are, and I hope you'll take that character upon your life. Well, our third message then moved us into a message called Under the Shadow, and uh, the story was that now it was barley harvest time when Ruth and Naomi arrived back in Bethlehem. So this is how they are going to sustain themselves, that I guess Naomi's a little too old to go and glean, so she stays at home, but Ruth is going to go and glean. And when she does, she somehow finds herself in the fields of Boaz, which is kin to Elimelech, which therefore is kin to Naomi, which therefore is distant kin even to Ruth. And we saw that Boaz, as this character came in, his name was important too. His name comes from the word Beaz, which means in him is strength. And so he's from Elimelech's family. The Bible says that he's a man of great wealth. 
And Boaz sees Ruth in his field and he approaches her and, and he says, hey, who, who are you? What you doing? And, and uh, he's impressed with her and he says, listen, you're a part of my kin, so don't go to any other fields. You just stay in my field and I'm going to command all the men that work for me not to touch you, not to give you a hard time. And in fact, we see that he, he begins to give them instruction, hey, leave a little extra on the ground for for Ruth and don't give her a hard time. And then Boaz speaks a blessing over Ruth and he says, you have come under the shadow of the Lord. And we talked about the importance of that phrase, what it means to come under the shadow. And so it means that the Lord becomes your protector, amen? And uh, your provider, amen? Your deliverer. And so he says, I have seen, not that you're just committed to Naomi, but that you've come under the shadow of of the Almighty, hallelujah. And so things begin to go well for Ruth and Naomi. Ruth is gleaning and providing, and these are uh, good times as they have returned. So listen, we go through tough times, we go through dry periods, but they're gonna be followed. We might feel empty-handed, but they're gonna be followed by good times. The Lord's gonna open up blessing. And so we need to claim this for our own lives, that I am under the shadow of the Almighty. He's my protector, he's my deliverer, he's the one who blesses my life, amen? It's not my effort, it's not my strength, it's not my, um, my mental ability or my education. Uh, it's the Lord, the Lord's the one who blesses my life. So. I close asking you to read Psalm 91, and I would encourage you to do that again and apply that to your own life, that you are the one who has come under the shadow of the Almighty, and that he's the one that's going to be your protector and your strength and your provider. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, then we went into our fourth message, which was sit still, and we saw this tradition of the kinsman redeemer. If you don't know what that is, listen to our message from last week if you missed it, or go over to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25 or both <laughs> and read Deuteronomy 25 and you'll find there the principle and the custom of the kinsman redeemer. And so the idea was that if a brother died and left a wife and the wife didn't have any children, then the brother would take the wife as his own and then he would raise up children so that his brother children could receive the dead brother's inheritance. I hope that made sense. Um, but at any rate, it was to keep uh, land and blessing within the family, and it was an idea of focusing on the family so that if this woman now is a widow with no children, we don't just don't send her off and say, we don't know you, she's joined our family. So I have one son-in-law, Brandon, and so Brandon, I'm glad you're a part of the family. I hope you're watching this, and I'm really glad you're a part of the family, and you're, you're like my own, and I don't know you quite all that well yet, and I hope I get to know you a whole lot more as our time goes along together. I think you're a fine young man, and I pray for you often, uh, but you're part of our family, and so we're thankful that you're in the family. I have two daughters getting married, and so I'm about to have two more, uh, Paul and Ryan. So Paul and Ryan, if you're watching this, I say the same thing to you, at least on your wedding day, I'll say this to you. <laughs> you're, you're, you're joining the family, you're a part of us. And, and yeah, we may, have, we, may be, we may be weird and have our eccentricities, but uh, you're coming into the family. And uh, again, you, you two guys, I, I don't know you all that well, but, but what I've seen in you, I like, and that's why I've said, yeah, you, you can marry my daughters. I, I like you guys. You seem to be good, fine, upstanding men. And so we want you not just marrying our daughters, we want you in the family. And um, we wanna be there to also do what we can for you to help. And so that was the idea of the Kinsman Redeemer was to always look uh, at the whole of the family and not to uh, segregate or disintegrate the family as maybe someone died or someone, you know, kind of got disenfranchised. So that was the idea. So at any rate, um, uh, so under this one, uh, sit still and the tradition of the kinsman redeemer is that you would marry this one that was close to you. Now, so for our young men, we won't practice that today. Amen. <laughs> That's not a practice we do today, but that was the practice there. So what we see here now is that Boaz knows that she can be redeemed. In other words, he can marry her and, and again, raise up children to Malon, her dead husband. So <coughs> as the story goes, uh, Ruth actually proposes to Boaz. Can you imagine that? So uh, again, that was in our message last week. If you missed it, check it out. 
But then Boaz says, yes, I will marry you, Ruth. He says, but there's one little problem. There's actually a redeemer closer. There's a relative who's closer to you than me. So he has a right to ask to marry you first. So Boaz says to her, listen, I'm going to go today and take care of it. And Ruth goes home to Naomi. And that's where we get our title from, sit still, because Naomi says to Ruth, listen, just sit still. Uh, I'm sure she said that because Ruth was probably like, I got to go down there and talk to those men. I got to tell them, I don't want to marry this guy I haven't met. I want to marry Boaz. I've been in his field now for six weeks gleaning. I've got to know him. He's the guy I want to marry. And, and Naomi says, no, Ruth, don't do that. That's not the way our culture works. That's not the system. You just sit still. And we said, sit still doesn't always mean just sit still, right? Because there's things you can do when you sit still. So sit still means to trust, amen? Pray. We talked last week about rest out of Hebrews chapter four. We, we talked about wait on the Lord, Isaiah 40, 31, amen? So sitting doesn't mean just, I'm gonna sit. But I'm going to sit, I'm going to pray, I'm going to believe, I'm going to rest in the Lord. For those of you who need a job, it doesn't mean stay home. Yeah, you need to go out and knock on doors. But as you do, don't go out in a panic. i got to have a job. Go out in confidence. The Lord is with me. The Lord's going to open a door. The Lord's going to show me where I can work. And the Lord's going to help me. Amen? So trust in the Lord. Cast your cares upon him. Rest on him. Wait on him. And so that's what Naomi told Ruth. And that brings us to our last message. So here's where we are as we come into our message today. Ruth is home. She's waiting. She's a little nervous. <laughs> Boaz is down talking to the men to see if he's allowed to marry me, right? And uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen. He's going to come back and tell me i got to marry some stranger I've never met. And so Ruth is waiting. And Boaz has gone down to the city gates to talk to the men. So let's go there. You got your Bible? Open to Ruth chapter 4. Sorry if my recap got a little long there. I didn't mean for that. I said we'd do it quickly, but at any rate, so we'll try and preach quickly, get through this. So uh, Ruth chapter four, verse one. Now Boaz went up to the gate. And so the gate was an important place of, of the city. That's where people met to do important business deals and to discuss important matters. So Boaz went up to the gate and he sat down there and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, turn aside, my friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down with Boaz. So here's this guy, never names him. I don't know what his name is. It never tells us. But this closer relative comes by. So in that day, you have to realize Boaz couldn't get on his cell phone and say, hey, Billy Bob, I want to talk to you. Can you come on down to the gate or can you come on down to the Starbucks? And, and I got something I got to talk to you about and uh, bring some guys with you or something. But no, he couldn't do that. So they just go down to the city gate and he had to wait. And so when he sees the guy, hey, there he is. Hey, come on, sit down with me. I need to talk to you a little bit. And so the guy comes and he sits with him. Well, once he sits with him, then Boaz, as they're sitting there, every time a guy comes by, he goes, hey, can you come and sit with us for a little while? We got to do some business here. And so he ends up attracting 10 guys. Hey, you, yeah, come on, sit with us. Hey, yeah, you, come over here, join us. Come sit down, have a, have a Starbucks with me. <laughs> We're having a little espresso here. And we're going to talk about something real important. Can you come join us? So once he got the 10 guys together, I didn't say that right, did I? Once he has, <laughs> once he has the 10 guys together and the kin, the kinsman, the relative who is closer to Ruth than he himself, he starts with his proposals and he says to them all, hey, you know, Naomi has returned from Moab and now she still has a piece of land that was in the family of Elimelech and it now belongs to her and she's poor. She needs to sell this piece of land. And so he says to the closest relative, he says, uh, but you, you are the closest relative. So you have right to buy it first. Uh, but I want to know if you're going to buy it because if you're not going to buy it, I'm going to buy it. Now, remember, scriptures already told us Boaz is a wealthy man. The other guy, I don't know. But Boaz is a wealthy man, so he says, if you're not going to buy it, I'm going to buy it. I'm going to add it to my, my farm. I'm going to increase my farm with his land. So the one thing I wanted to point out from this scripture is it's a good thing to do things the right way. Amen? Uh, Boaz could have tried to circumvent the customs 
and bought the land and married Ruth and not done it the right way. But he goes about it the right way. Amen. Sometimes in life, there can be a temptation to circumvent the right way of doing something, of getting what we want or going where we want to go or doing what we want to do. Don't do that. The Lord is with you. Amen. Uh, the Lord has plans for your life and he will bring them to pass. You can trust him. And so when we behave that way, it's a lack of trust. But notice how Boaz is trusting the Lord. Boaz isn't overly concerned about the piece of land, but he's highly concerned about being able to marry Ruth. And think about this, something of that importance, of that emotion, and yet he's saying, I'm still gonna do it the right way. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna present it to the relative. I'm gonna have 10 witnesses. He says, yeah, yeah. If he says no, then we'll have to go from there. So at any rate, it's a good thing to do things the right way, not being sneaky, even, even if there's a risk of great loss. He could have lost the land. Again, I don't think it was a big deal to him, but he could have lost Ruth, which was a very big deal to him. So he trusted the Lord. So the other man now says, sure, I'll buy the land. I got the money. I could use some more land. I could increase my farm too. I'll buy the land. Then Boaz drops the bomb on him. Well, it's not just the land. So let's look at this. Verse, verse five, Ruth four, verse five. Then Boaz said to this other man, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Wow. So he drops his bomb on him and he says, uh, you're going to have to also marry Ruth. Now, notice that he kind of downplays that a bit. He doesn't say, Ruth, that beautiful gal who showed up here in our town and who is of great character and is an excellent woman and a hard worker. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't highlight her good traits, but he calls her a Moabitess. Now, um, yeah, it's discrimination. Yeah, it might be kind of racist, but he's, he's downplaying Ruth because he doesn't want to oversell this thing. He doesn't want her to go, okay, I'll take Ruth. And so he's, yeah, it's kind of not nice thing to do, but he calls Ruth the Moabitess. And he's trying to sour the deal a little bit. And at this word, the guy says, okay, I'm out. <laughs> I, I'm okay to buy the land, but I'm not okay to marry the Moabitess, right? And he says, because he can't mingle that with his inheritance, because then his kids aren't gonna get what they're entitled to, what his kids are entitled to will get watered down if he has children with Ruth. So uh, he's not interested. So the custom was that this man would take off his sandal and give it to Boaz, which he did. And so as Boaz is holding the sandal, he says to the elders, you are witness today that he has passed the deal. He's passed the sandal. He's passed the deal to me. I can buy the land and I can marry Ruth. And... Um, and so he's then, in a sense, given permission by the culture, by the 10 elders, that he can buy the land. The elders respond, yes, we are witnesses of this today. And then they speak a blessing over him. And this is wonderful. There is an importance of speaking the blessing over people in our lives. Uh, last Sunday was Father's Day. So to all of our fathers out there, happy Father's Day. I'm sorry I didn't say it in the video. I sent it in our little text before we sent out the, the video. But happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. But on Father's Day, I called my children and, and, and left them a, a voice blessing, a voice, uh, you know, just speaking the blessing over their life. And so I hope I can remember to do that every Father's Day. But uh, fathers is an important thing, and for all of us, it's an important thing to learn to speak the blessing, to tell those that we love they are blessed, that the Lord is with them. And so these guys, they speak the blessing uh, over, over Boaz. So let's look at that. Verse, uh, we'll find that in verse 11, and we can skip down to the second half of that. And they say, may the Lord... Make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah 
and become famous in Bethlehem. Wow, <laughs> isn't that wonderful? So he says, may the Lord make this woman coming into your home like Rachel and Leah. May she build up a, a whole generation, not just have a couple kids for you, but build a whole generation of descendants that are gonna be a blessing. And he says, may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah, wow. And so here's the blessing of the Lord. And again, sometimes in the church, some people have a problem with this, but we wanna speak that. May you be blessed, may you become wealthy, may you be healthy and strong, may you live a long life, amen? I speak that blessing over you, hallelujah. <laughs> And then, um, may you be famous. May you become famous in Bethlehem. Well, who was born in Bethlehem? We'll be getting to that real soon. <laughs> but may you be famous in Bethlehem. And may you make fam Bethlehem famous. Bethlehem was unknown. And now Bethlehem's famous. Almost everybody in the world knows Bethlehem when you say it. So hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then let's look at verse 12. Moreover, they're still speaking. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah through the offspring which the Lord shall give you by this young woman. Hallelujah. So the blessing of Perez. Perez was the son of Tamar and Judah. Now it's a bit of a strange story, but go back to Genesis 38 and you'll find that story. The Messiah is to come to Judah, but then that blessing is passed along to Perez. That Messiah is going to come through Perez. And now that blessing has been passed along to Boaz and Ruth. That Messiah is going to come through their lineage. Hallelujah. Now, interesting thing about Tamar, like Ruth, Tamar was a widow. Tamar was a widow twice before she had Perez. And so uh, again, you'll find that story in Genesis 38, but they speak the blessing of Perez over Boaz. Well, verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth. And so that's the very beginning that, that they were married and she became his wife. Uh, not a lot of details there. That's the whole thing. They got married. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm sure it was a great celebration. They didn't tell us any of it. I'm sorry they didn't, but that's all we got. Second part of that verse says, and he went into her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. So again, doesn't tell us a whole lot. They got married and Ruth became pregnant and had a son. And Naomi is now grandma. <laughs> Hallelujah, grandma Naomi, isn't that awesome? Do you remember not too long ago, just a few pages back, <laughs> just a few months back in their lives, Naomi said, please don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara because Naomi is pleasant and Mara means bitter. Don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. My life's so hard. I'm so broken. She's once again Naomi. Amen. The blessing of the Lord has flowed back into her life. In fact, as we read through this and we look at Naomi's language, which we talked about in another message, Naomi seems to think the Lord is against her. And yet we see all through the book, the Lord is with Naomi. The Lord is actually helping Naomi. And yet Naomi feels like the Lord is against her. So if you feel that way yourself, know the Lord is with you and he's helping you behind the scenes, even if things aren't well for you at the moment. All right, verse 14, it says, then the woman, excuse me, not the woman, the women. This is the women of the town. Then the women said to Naomi. So the women have come to Naomi. Naomi's got her new little grandbaby. Naomi's now, no more Mara. She's pleasant again. The women come to Naomi and they speak a blessing over her. <laughs> and they said, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. Hallelujah. Now, when we read this verse, in fact, when I read it the first time, Redeemer, I thought he was talking about Boaz, hasn't left you without a Redeemer, because he's the one who's redeemed Ruth, which has in turn redeemed Naomi. But the Redeemer that they're talking about in this verse is the baby, that the baby is the Redeemer, and the Messiah is going to come. Now, this isn't Messiah, but it's like a type of Messiah. The Messiah is going to come from Boaz and Ruth lineage. And so this little baby now is called the Redeemer. Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer, this baby, today. 
And may his name, whose name, the baby's name, become famous in Israel. And so uh, that was fulfilled, that this baby was a good baby and that his name has become famous in Israel. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But also, who else's name is famous who comes from Bethlehem? Amen. <laughs> and so that's where that, that comes from. Well, let's go on, verse 15. May he also, this is still the same blessing, the women speaking to Naomi, may he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Look at the reputation Ruth, the Moabitess, has gained in Israel, in Bethlehem, Judah. Hallelujah. She is better than seven sons. Do you know back in that day, there was hardly anything better than a son. And I'm sorry to say that to all you ladies out there, but that's the way it was. And that's the way it still is in many cultures today. I don't know why. I have three daughters. I'm very happy to have three daughters. <laughs> uh, I don't understand that. But that's the way some people think and some cultures still operate today, that somehow a son is important and a daughter is a bit of a disgrace or disappointment. Well, again, I'm very sorry, sorry daughters out there. That's not the way it is in the eyes of the Lord and that's not the way it is in reality, but that's just something that gets messed up in some cultures today. And so that's the way it was back then. And yet they say, Ruth is better than seven sons. Hallelujah, wow. So he says, may he be a restorer of life. May he be a restorer of your name, Naomi. May he be a restorer of pleasantness and a sustainer of your old age that you will grow old and life now makes sense again because life didn't make any sense to you. You were only trying, in their mind, they were only trying to survive when they left the house of bread and of prayer and of praise and they went to the toilet to eat bread and her husband died and her children died and man, life just didn't make sense. And they're saying, may this little baby bring back the sense of purpose and belonging to the community and belonging to God's plan for your life. Naomi suffered a lot, but her life is not a loss. Maybe you've suffered a lot, but your life is not a loss. Amen. God still has great purpose. Well, let's move on. We need to close today. Uh, jump down verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. First part of verse 17. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. Wow. <laughs> Look at that, that verse. It said, the women who were neighbors actually gave the baby his name. That's not the way, again, it's normally done. Normally the father would give his name or the father and his family would give the name to the son. But here the women, the neighbor women come and they're the one that determines the baby's name. A son is born to Naomi. That's pretty amazing too, not to Ruth, to Naomi. Naomi needed this baby, they saw. So they named him Obed. Well, here's another name that becomes very important to us, amen? And do you know what the name Obed means? Obed means worshiper. And I believe what they were saying by calling him Obed was Naomi now has a reason to worship the Lord again. Well, that's encouraging, but can I say something to you? Even if you're going through a hard time, you have a reason to worship the Lord. Carol and I used to teach kids church together many, many years ago. And we would tell the kids every Sunday, there's two times to praise the Lord when things are going good and when things are going bad. <laughs> and so we always praise the Lord, amen? So Naomi didn't need a reason to worship the Lord again, but the Lord gave her one. And I believe that's why he was named Obed, meaning that Naomi now has a reason to worship the Lord again. Well, let's finish off. Let's read the rest of verse 17 and down to the end of the chapter. It's a little boring genealogy, but it's important to us. So pay close attention. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse. That means Obed the baby. When he grows up, he has a child. That child is Jesse. And Jesse grows up and becomes a father. And his son is David, who is King David. And then it names the generations. Now, these are the generation of Perez. Now we go back up. Remember the blessing of Perez? 
we go back up to that blessing of Perez, who came from Tamar, of Judah. Judah's where Messiah will come from, which will pass to Perez. And now it's going to tell you where this promise is going to pass through for Messiah to be born. Okay, so now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram. To Ram, Aminadab. And to Aminadab was born Nashon, to Nashon, Salmon, to Salmon was born Boaz. Hallelujah. And Boaz married Ruth, and to Boaz was born, we just read it, Obed. Obed grew up, had a child, was born to him, Jesse. Jesse grew up and born to him was David, who became King David. And we know that Jesus came through the line of King David. Hallelujah. <laughs> We look at this story and we look at the close. I know there's some boring verses. This one was born to this one, but wow, wow, wow. Ruth, little girl from Moab, no one special, less than special. She's a widow. She's a Moabite. Nothing really going for her, but <laughs> you see, even when you got nothing and you're nobody, but when you come to the Lord. When she chooses to follow the God of Israel, do you remember that? She says, your God will be my God. Hallelujah. She chooses to commit her life to Naomi. She chooses to commit her life to Almighty God. Everything changes. She ends up in the lineage of Messiah, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I told you when we started do you know why Jesus was born in Bethlehem? I hope now you know. It was because Ruth. Because Ruth came back with Naomi to Bethlehem, Judah, met Boaz, married Boaz, had a baby named Obed. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, Bethlehem is also called the city of David because that's where King David is also born. And it becomes the city of Messiah. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. If God can do that through a little Moabite girl, what can he do in your life? Amen? The possibilities are limitless. Put your trust in him today. Well, I hope we haven't been too long, but it's been a great series. I hope you enjoyed the book of Ruth. I hope it's meaningful to you. I hope as we're coming out of the uh, COVID-19 struggle, that you will see this book as hope for you, just as Ruth and Naomi came out of this season of struggle, of death, and then of traveling to a land where they weren't going to be really well received, but things ended up going very well for them as they returned to Bethlehem. So in your life, know that God has great plans for you and that he's going to restore and beyond restore, he's going to take you past that into new blessings, into new heights. Amen. All right, well, let's pray. I want to pray for you that just as Naomi returned to Bethlehem, that if you need to return to the Lord today, return to the Lord. Uh, if you need to return to your land, uh, whatever country you're from, return. Uh, pray, see if that's what the Lord would have for you. I don't know. Uh, but commit your life to him. Be fully devoted to him. Come under the shadow of his wing. Take refuge in him. Learn to sit still and rest and wait on the Lord that he can do great things through your life, that he is your redeemer. Amen? So that's what we want to pray today. Uh, and then, of course, again, if God has anything geographical for you, that's between you and him. I'm returning to America, I hope, on July 15th, but I also don't plan to stay. I plan to return to Morocco then a few weeks later if we're able to. So that'll be another prayer. Pray that Pastor Chris and Sister Carol can return to Morocco. Uh, that's certainly our plan to do. The only problem would be restrictions of us coming back from America due to COVID-19. So pray for that. All right, let's pray as we close. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the book of Ruth. We thank you how Ruth and Naomi returned to Bethlehem, Judah, to the house of bread and of praise. Hallelujah. And though they think they're empty-handed and life is going to be hard, you go before them and you make a way where there seems to be no way and you miraculously connect Ruth to uh, Boaz and they get married and they have this child Obed and we see then that Messiah comes through that lineage, what a miraculous, miraculous story. And it all becomes of a little decision of a little girl 
who instead of taking the advice to go home, decides, no, I'm going to go on to Bethlehem. I'm going to go on to the house of bread and of praise. I'm going to go on and serve the one true living God. And she says to Naomi, your God will be my God. Right now, Lord, anyone watching who needs to rededicate their life to you, we just pray that right now, that Father, we give our life to you fully, that we will serve you. We will go where you lead us. We will do what you call us to do. We will strive to read and understand and obey your word to the best of our ability. And Lord, we will seek the guidance of your Holy Spirit to guide us. When we fail, we will seek your forgiveness and restoration, that we stray not far from the truth, but that we stay very close to the path that you have laid for us. And so, Lord God, for everyone watching, lead, guide us, bring us into the blessings, just as you brought them into the blessings that you had for their lives. Bring us in the blessings you have planned for our lives. Teach us, Lord, to be fully devoted. Teach us, Lord, to rest under the shadow of your wings. Teach us, Lord, to learn to sit still and to wait on you. And teach us, Lord, to rejoice in our Redeemer. And just as little uh, Obed was named worshiper, may we also be worshipers. May we have reason to worship. And even in those days that are dark and difficult, Lord, may we even just look back to the cross and know that we always have a reason to worship, for you have redeemed us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Be with each one uh, as they go forth this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, it's been good being with you again by video. Please again be with us here next week by video. And uh, reach out to me. Send me a WhatsApp. Let me know what's going on in your life and how you're doing. Would love to hear from you. And uh, heard someone in our church is pregnant, so we rejoice with them. I'm a little apprehensive to release the name. Uh, I hope I hear from them this week and tell me it's okay that it's public. You know, sometimes people aren't public with that immediately. But if you have some good news or anything to share, let me know and I'll, I'll announce it on here so people in the church can know and be in touch with you. Uh, or if you have a prayer need that we can share that. Um, anybody wants to send me a video clip, feel free to do that. Keep it short so we can share many of them, but send me a 30 second or one minute video clip saying hello to the church and we'll be glad to tag it onto this so everyone can see you. All right, we'll say the benediction with me. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us. Amen, amen, amen. Have a great day and a great week in the Lord, and I hope to see you here next week. God bless you. Bye-bye.